Hello, welcome back to Road Tripping with Rachel. We are on Vlogmas Day 20. That means Christmas is five days away, so if you haven't finished your Christmas shopping yet, now's the time to do it. There's still plenty of time. If you're a little tight on money, I always recommend baked goods because everyone loves a good like cinnamon roll or cookies or things like that. So thank you so much for joining me for day 20. We have been doing a mini series as we've been going through the 12 days of Christmas. So since we are on day 20 of Vlogmas, that means we are on day 10 of the 12 days of Christmas. So today we are going to talk about the 10 Lords of Leaping. But before that, we have talked about the Nine ladies dancing, eight maids a milking, seven swans a swimming, six geese a laying, five golden rings, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree. And we have learned what each of those things actually mean because the 12 Days of Christmas was created to be a learning tool for people who really couldn't read. So by learning to connect symbolism with a core tenet of scripture, they were able to remember these lessons that the church really wanted to be able to teach them. So let's run through the days real quick. So partridge in a pear tree, we're talking about Jesus. Uh, very practical, think about Jesus dying on the cross. It doesn't get much more practical <laughs> than uh, the gift that just keeps on giving that God has saved all who believe in him and is continually saving you from the sins you are currently committing. The two turtle doves are the Old and the New Testament. They do go together. You can't get rid of one without completely damaging the other. So always keep old and new whenever you are studying and make sure that you're balancing them in your daily Bible reading. Three French hens. We're talking about faith, hope, and charity. We talked about how we sometimes view some of those words in a particular way because of our current Western culture, but that they do actually have different meanings from when they were actually used. And then we talked about the four calling birds, which are the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels because the things in them tend to happen in more of like a chronological order, although there are a few things that aren't necessarily like that in them. And then John is actually a gospel that teaches us a lot about theology and how Jesus is both God and man. Then we have the five golden rings. This is the Pentateuch or the five first uh, books of the Bible. And they're also known as the law of Moses or even Torah. So great books. They set the stage for much of everything else that follows in scripture. When we talked about the six geese lane, we learned that those are actually the six days of creation. If you go back and watch that video, I actually talk about how uh, the seventh day God rested on them. And I have done a series of videos previously on this channel where I go into a more in-depth look on what happened on each day. So I encourage you to go back and check those out. Then on day seven, we talked about how there are some differences in what they think the seventh day could have been. It could have been the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. It also could have indicated the seven sacraments. Uh, during the mid, uh, medieval times, uh, Europe was Catholic <laughs> up until the Reformation in the early 1500s. So it is very important to recognize that it is quite possible that the uh, seven swans of swimming were indicative of these two varying ideas. Probably it would have depended on like what parish you were a part of or even like the area of Europe that you were actually coming from. Then we have the eight maids of milking and we're talking about the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. Super exciting. We took a more in-depth look at those and then we had our nine ladies dancing which our nine ladies dancing were actually the fruits of the spirit, which there are a lot of songs out there. If you don't know the, the fruits of the spirit, all I remember from the, my childhood song is that the fruit of the spirit is not a coconut. Uh, but <laughs> that was what I remember from the song. Um, but then you are also able to just learn them in order. That's uh, how I've learned them. But now we are on to day 10 with the 10 Lords of Leaping. And the 10 Lords of Leaping are the 10 Commandments, probably the greatest 10 that is in the Bible. So a perfect 10. 
Okay, so the Ten Commandments are actually found in Exodus chapter 20. And one of the things I always tell people whenever we're talking about the commandments or whenever we're getting into more of like a theological discussion about um, people saying that people, individuals, churches, when they start talking about the fact that there are so many rules that come with Christianity and being a part of a church, first off, foot off the accelerator for just a moment and really stop and think about like one, what you just said <laughs> um, about there being rules in churches. Churches are an entity that have doctrinal beliefs and they also have tertiary beliefs as well. And sometimes those tertiary beliefs will not line up with scripture. So when you are looking at joining a church, I highly recommend you read like what their church covenant looks like, um, what their, their uh, doctrinal stances are on things. And one, make sure that everything lines up for scripture and make sure that you agree with their take on something. Um, there are some churches out there in different denominations that are out there that hold to specific beliefs that, like I said, they're tertiary beliefs. That does not mean that they are core tenets of scripture. It means they're things that we can sit down and have a discussion about. And it's not a big enough issue that I'm going to break fellowship with you. If it is a core tenet of scripture, um, if they are challenging whether or not Jesus is the son of God, then that is not a church. <laughs> that is not a church. Um, and you should not be affiliated with them. Uh, so, but it's also when we're talking about like the rules that come along with scripture. I've said it before and I will continue to say it. It is not about a rule or a law the way we tend to think about a rule or a law. In scripture, it is because this is God, there is an appropriate way in which we can interact with him. Now, if we are Christians, then that means that, yes, we have access to God. We can call on him as Allah, my father, and the spirit himself will intercede for us with groanings that words cannot express as we see in Romans chapter eight. However, he is still God. He is still God and I am still a sinful person. And so there is an appropriate way that we are going to approach God. And when we are talking about the Ten Commandments, the purpose of the Ten Commandments is not that they're trying to give us a bunch of rules. It's saying that because I am God and I am holy and I cannot be in the presence of sin because that sinful entity will die this is the appropriate way for you to approach me. And this is the appropriate way that you should be viewing me and how you should be interacting with other people. These would be like morals. And realistically, these are when we start talking about um, the Ten Commandments, a lot of people will look at them and they will say that there are two major sections of the Ten Commandments and they're not split evenly down the middle. You have this is how we are to interact with God. And then this is how we are to interact with other people. And God gives us relationship advice on this that's very basic. And I really can't think of any of these issues that people would really have a serious problem with, especially when we're talking about how we're supposed to interact with other people. Now, people uh, do not like to be told that uh, they are not God themselves. So I am a little bit more understanding of someone who says that they don't like the Ten Commandments because God tells you how you are to interact with him. However, he's still God. So, and the other thing that I really always want to point out to people is that 19 comes before 20. Um, all of the 19 chapters in Exodus, before we ever get to 20, Genesis, before we get to chapter 20 of Exodus, shows us why God gives us the Ten Commandments and why he is telling us how we are going to interact with him. In fact, Exodus chapter... 20 verse 2 starts with and actually verse 1 let's just go with verse 1 then God spoke all these words verse 1 of Exodus chapter 20 I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the place of slavery this verse now becomes the salvific theme of the New Testament you will see this repeated over and over and over again and then you will even see places in the New Testament where it references back to this. This is the salvific theme. And later in the Old Testament, you will see 
that God brought them out of Babylon, that that is going to become a secondary salvific theme throughout scripture. It's beautiful how God paints this picture for us about how he brought us out of slavery. He brought us out of sin and death. And this is now how we are to react to him because he is the God that did that. So let's go ahead and let's just work our way through these 10 commandments. So first commandment, do not have other gods before me. Sounds really simple, tends to be really difficult. When I was in college, one of the things that, or I guess it's not a thing, it's a class. One of the classes I took was um, leadership and worship. Now I cannot sing despite the fact that I sing the 12 days of Christmas almost every time I get on here. I really am not the person you ever want to lead a worship service never my sister is kind enough and she'll get mad at me because I'm calling her out again <laughs> she has described my singing voice as a bullfrog with a cold going through puberty <laughs> to which I love you Sarah and I think that's so funny that that's how you describe my singing voice <laughs> but be that as it may one of the things that I learned at that class is how do we actually define God just in a general sense and God, not necessarily big G, little G, whatever you want to call it, is someone or something that is worthy of being worshiped. So when we say you will have, do not have any other gods before me, this is God speaking. So he's saying, do not have something that you consider to be worthy of worship above and beyond myself because nothing else is what brought you out of Egypt. It was me. And I think this is something that we do struggle with just as people, because we are sinful is that we can get fixated on things and we can begin to worship them by giving them our time, by giving them our attention, by ignoring the things that are around us. And this is what this is calling us back to, to remember that all these other things are not what have pulled us out of death and sin and damnation. It is only God that has done that. Do not make an idol for yourself. Okay. Here in the West, <laughs> um, although it is possible here in the United States and in North America, because we are such a great melting pot of different people, different backgrounds, different faiths. Um, I imagine it is possible that there would be some households here that would probably actually have household idols. Um, however, uh, we're not supposed to have thing, things that we are giving our worship to. And something that, and some um, versions will use it in, where it will be, the words will be translated as like a graven image. So now this is just, this is me personally speaking. I think we need to be very careful then about pictures that we have of like Jesus or pictures that we have around that um, make us picture God in a certain way uh, because realistically, whenever we see some of those pictures there, even in like children's Bibles, um, a lot of times we see that Jesus is not necessarily ethnically correct. Um, I know this might be a shock to some people, but Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> um, therefore he was Middle Eastern. <laughs> so, um, if I were to throw it out there, I would probably say Jesus probably had pretty dark curly hair, if not black hair, really, really dark brown hair, and was probably more olive complected would just be my guess you know, AD 30 and all that, like that would just be my guess out there. Um, so I, I do consider it inappropriate whenever I see like a blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus, because that's not ethnically appropriate one, but also, um, when we put a form like that to God, we are also uh, hemming him in and we begin to identify with him in that way. So if we want to picture like a 
Caucasian Jesus, then we begin to think of Jesus as being a Caucasian God and that he's for the people who of Europe or he is for a very specific group of people. We stop thinking about him as being this person who was, is meant for all people that he died as a sacrifice for all mankind. And we start to think of him, well, he died as a sacrifice to me and for people who look like me. So I think it is very important that when we have the conversation about what is a graven image, what is an idol, you know, an idol is another way of saying that this is something that I am putting all of my effort and energy to, and I am attempting to manipulate in order to get a given response or something I want to give credit to when I get a response that I really want. So if you are going to pray to the, um, you know, rain gods, and then it rains, you, what you are essentially saying is because I did these things, I was able to get a response that I wanted out of it. Not necessarily it rained because God allowed it to rain through the miracles that is science. And so you begin to give credit to things that don't deserve to have that credit. And you begin to take a piece of wood or a piece of stone and you make it into a God and you make it into something you were saying is worthy of worship, which means you're actually breaking two commandments in one shot. I have enough problem breaking a single commandment. I don't think I need to be breaking like multiple in one go. Just my opinion on this. Okay. Commandment three. Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God. So there are different understandings of this. And I think it is really, it has to do with like the name portion here. Not necessarily um, the expression that typically we see being used, like OMG. Uh, <laughs> that was an appropriate place to, to include that. Um, when we're talking about a name and we have to consider the cultural context at this point, and I think it plays over into today, I don't think this is something that gets lost, but when you're talking about someone's name, you're also talking about their reputation. Um, what was the crucible? Um, I highly recommend you watch the play the crucible at some point, um, in your life if you've never seen it, but towards the end before our main character dies, cause I mean, it's been around forever. So most people are going to know the general context of it before the main character dies. Um, he could have been exonerated had he just signed his name to this document, like in confessing that he was a witch. And instead, like he writes his name and then he tears it up because he says, this is my name. This is my reputation. This is my honor. He's like, I can't give this up for the sake of this. That is really what this is getting at here. It's not about saying like OMG or something like that. What we're really talking about is, are you damaging the reputation? And if we were to put this into historical context of when this is being done, part of the context of the Ten Commandments is that the people of Israel were supposed to be different from the cultures that are around them. And that's not necessarily just the Ten Commandments. If you go throughout Exodus and Leviticus, you see it play out much more how as a culture and as a people, they were to be very different from the cultures and the peoples that were surrounding them. They're saying, don't do something that is going to be bring shame or dishonor on the God that you are serving you should be above reproach. And in the same way, if you are a Christian, you know, we all struggle with this. We're all going to fail, but we shouldn't be going out of our way to do things that are contrary to who God is. We are supposed to be representatives of him here while we're alive and kicking. And we're supposed to leave a legacy that leads other people to faith. So don't misuse the representation of who God is. Okay. Four, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Let's talk about Sabbath just real quick. So Sabbath is the idea of rest. God took the seventh day and made it holy. God rested on that day. The whole concept of Sabbath or Sabbath is that, or Shabbat, 
is that we are supposed to rest and be completely reliant on God for that day, that he is going to take care of providing the things that we would normally be working for. It is a reminder that God provides everything anyway. Like you can get out and you can work the ground as hard as you want at trying to grow vegetables. But if God says it ain't growing there, it's just not going to grow. And you have to accept that. So uh, being a farmer, being a fisherman, anything that is highly dependent, excuse me, on the land or seasons, anything like that is a testimony to having to have faith in God, even if you won't ever say that. Now, those are the things that are really meant to define like our relationship to God with Sabbath, I think also being like for us personally, um, but also it is a continual reliance on God and recognizing who God is. Now we're going to get into the part of scripture where we're talking about like how our relationship with other people is supposed to be functioning. So we are on commandment five, honor your father and mother. I think this is pretty self-explanatory in all honesty. Um, honor can come in many different forms. Sometimes that means actually listening. Sometimes that means obeying. Sometimes it means not doing things that you know is going to bring great shame to your family and be an embarrassment to your family, to your parents in particular. And it also means caring for them and allowing them to have dignity. Um, I think this is, I, I personally see this play out more with um, like my parents and my parents' friends now who are now at the point where like their parents are getting older and elderly now and they're having to make decisions. Okay, like do we put grandma or grandpa in a home? Do we... Um, do we bring in a nurse to be like, and keep them at home? Um, we have to go out and purchase like different, um, personal care items for them now. Like, how do we do that and still be able to honor them without making a big deal about it and taking away independence, but still allowing them to have all that dignity. Um, I think that is one way that I actively see honor for the parents being played out. Do not murder. I think we can agree on this. Killing people is wrong. Um, now, I would say that um, obviously we do see, have war and we will see in scripture where God calls his people to go to war. But I think it's important to make the distinction that murder is very personal. Um, for you to murder someone, you have to have a certain amount of hate and dislike for them in your, in your heart. Um, and that there is a difference when someone is killed as a part of war because that's not something that's necessarily personal. Um, as I, I'm talking for the individual, um, obviously sometimes people go to war and it is very pers a very personal reason as to why they're doing it. But as for the individual of actually hating the individual that you are killing, I think there is a distinction there and I think that is something we have to be really careful about, but that's also why we can have conscientious objectors, at least here in the United States, and I think Canada also would allow that, um, but a conscientious ex uh, objector to where like this is not something that I can do. And I think there are, when we're um, having this discussion, I think a lot of this is going to come down to your personal um, theology of this. So I won't try and dictate this one, but I think we can all agree, though, that at least on the level of murder, yes, it's wrong. Don't kill other people. Okay. Do not commit adultery. Do I really need to go into this? If you have married someone, that is the right person. Don't run around and cheat on them. I'm just saying. I don't think I should have to explain this one. As the single person, I should not have to explain this one to anybody. Um, do not steal. Don't take what's your, not yours. You know, work for it. Earn it. If there's something you really want, plan for it. Save for it. Don't take it simply because someone else has it. Um, it's not worth it. Don't take something that's not yours. We teach our kids that when they're in preschool or Sunday school or very, very early on with their cousins or siblings. Um, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Now, I, when I was little, I used to think this meant like if you ever went to court... <laughs> Because of the, the word testimony. Um, what it really means, and this is, has become my understanding as an adult, is basically don't gossip and don't spread false rumors about someone. Because we see, like, you know, the Good Samaritan 
you know, who is the neighbor? Well, the Samaritan was the neighbor, even though the Samaritan was someone that most Jewish people wouldn't have wanted to have been around. But false testimony would be um, very much like tearing someone else down for the sake of tearing someone else down. It's not like, hey, I'm called to testify in a court of law that I saw this person do something. In that case, you are reporting like a fact as you know it to be. When you're gossiping, it is a... Uh, possibility. It's a conjecture. It's not something that you know to be true. Uh, it's just some, a lot of times it's just hearsay and you're spreading hearsay. Don't covet your neighbor's house, wife, servants, or animals. I abridge that. Basically, you know, don't want something that someone else has so badly that you're willing to do whatever you have to do in order to get it. You know, if, I mean, one, you shouldn't be covering like someone else's spouse to begin with. Um, that's right up there with adultery. But, um, you know, their house, their animals, their servants don't want something that someone else has worked very hard for. Um, if you want something that badly, you know, work for it, plan for it, save for it. I think covet is when you're willing to do anything in order to get it would probably be like, because it's different from I want this. I think coveting would be better defined as I understand it, as I want this so much that I'm willing to do whatever I have to do in order to get it and manipulate the situation in my favor in order to get it. Um, and I think a lot of it is things and people that we want. It is, but if I want a house that badly, I will work and I will save for it and I will invest my money and I will take the time to do it. I'm not going to try and manipulate someone out of not having a home and not having like their resources available to them anymore. That is where I think we really run into trouble with this. When you are willing to do whatever you have to do in order to get something that you want because someone else has it and you want it. Okay, so those are my thoughts on the Ten Commandments. I hope that it has given you at least a little bit of food for thought. Feel free to discuss it with your small group or at home or, you know, yell at me if you disagree with me about it in your notebooks. Please keep comments nice. That's my opinion on that. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure that you like and subscribe. That really helps out my channel. Thank you, YouTube algorithm. And I will see you tomorrow for day 21 of Vlogmas. Bye.